All right, we're going to keep moving on here. We're getting towards the end of the semester. We're going to cover chapter 34 right now, financial structure. The next one will be chapter 35. I will upload chapter 34 uh, today and chapter 35 tomorrow. Chapter 35 deals with financial structure. And what we're actually going to talk about are debt securities. In other words, the authority to I issue debt securities the different types of debt securities, and then we'll also talk about equity securities, the issuance of shares, and the different classes of shares. So um, we'll finish up the chapter talking about dividends and other distributions and the types of dividends and other distributions. We'll talk about the legal restrictions on dividends and other distributions, declarations and payment of distributions, and liability for improper dividends and distribution. So let's talk a little bit about the financial structure of a corporation in particular. Obviously, capital is necessary for any business to function. There are two principal sources for corporate financing, and that's either debt and equity investment in securities. Debt is basically, for those of you that had finance 3403, those are mainly bonds. So when we talk about debt, they're usually in the form of bonds. And equity would be uh, the issuance of shares. And that's really what this chapter is about. It's not a long chapter, uh, but the concepts here are very, very important because obviously the financial structure of the firm really dictates a lot of the uh, financial decisions that the firm will make or undertake. So let's start off with debt securities. So where, you know, let, let's start off with the very basics, which is the authority to issue debt securities. So let's, let's define what a debt security is. It's a source of capital creating no ownership interest and involving the corporation's promise to re repay funds that are lent to it. So in other words, we're talking about debt. And, and in particular, when we talk about debt, we're talking about bonds, which is a, a debt security. So again, very, very common source of capital. The key factor is it does not create an ownership interest, whereas stocks or, or, or shares of stock create an ownership interest, debt does not. So in other words, the creditor really has a uh, claim for the amount of that debt, right? For the amount of the money that's lent to the firm has no ownership interest, so uh, they do not participate in the decision-making process. So they have no control, but they do get paid back first. So that is the trade-off, right? Control versus um, not necessarily a guarantee payment, but a more likely to be paid. Shareholders do not have to be paid back. Uh, debt holders do. Uh, unless, obviously, the, the corporation is bankrupt. So what's the rule? Each corporation has the power to issue debt securities as determined by the board of directors. So again, the board of directors, remember, are elected by the shareholders, and so the board of directors decides whether they're going to issue debt securities, how many, and in what amount. Uh, it, it's a careful balance because... Obviously, debt needs to be paid back, uh, whereas securities really don't need to be paid back. I mean, there are dividends, but a company does not have to declare dividends, so it really is not an obligation. Now, um, with bonds, the company does have to service the debt or make the interest payments. So that's the difference. So the board of directors has to be very, very careful when they determine how much debt they're going to take on. And they have to be careful not to over leverage themselves or issue too many bonds. And again, that capital structure, which we call, which is the, the mix of how much debt and how much um, how many shares of stock, uh, debt versus equity, uh, that's a decision that the board of directors really needs to make. There are different types of debt securities. Um, and this is true of, of loans in general. 
uh, we have unsecured bonds and we have secured bonds. Unsecured bonds, uh, we call those debentures. And really, uh, the, with unsecured bonds, the company uh, only has the obligation of the corporation behind them, meaning there's no security. So uh, if the company goes bankrupt, uh, you know, if the company doesn't have any assets or, or whatever the case may be, then there is no security. There's no collateral, in other words, for these unsecured bonds. Secured bonds, on the other hand, are claims against a corporation's general assets and are also liens on specific property. So it may be that the bonds could be secured by fixed assets. The bonds could be secured by an office building, for example, that the corporation owns. Uh, so it can be secured by either personal property or by real property. So those are, are the options. Um, and there could also be a security in, in other assets as well. So for example, a corporation can provide as collateral a claim or a security interest in its accounts receivables. So really, or in its inventory, any of its assets can be used as collateral to secure bonds. Most, and I hate to make general statements, but most bonds or most debt security will be unsecured. There's also something called income bonds and participating bonds. So income bonds, it's a condition to some um, extent the payment of interest on corporate earnings. So in other words, you will get your interest, but how much of that interest you get paid back is going to depend on corporate earnings. So for example, if there are no earnings and, and you have an income bond, uh, then you're not going to get any interest. And that's all done as part of the indenture or what we call the the issue itself the security the bond documents will state exactly whether the bond will be an income bond or a participating bond participating bonds call for a stated percentage of return regardless of earnings with additional payments dependent upon earnings so in other words there's there's a base rate or a floor let's say that we have uh, 15% participating bonds with a 10% guaranteed earnings. So that means that there's going to be a 10% interest paying, payment no matter what, and that additional 5% would be paid um, depending upon earnings, right? So if there's earnings, you get that additional 5%. If not, then you only get that part that is actually stated, which in my example was, was the 10%. So... That's another distinction that we make in, in bonds. And, and yet another that we have is we have convertible bonds and we have callable bonds. Now, convertible bonds may be exchanged for other securities. The most common type of convertible bond would be a bond that is convertible to equity. So let's say, and, and it depends how it's structured, right? The bond document itself will have all the conditions. So it may be that uh, the bond is convertible to uh, stock after five years or after six years or after, you know, the company exceeds $100 million in, in capital or whatever the case may be. It can be structured however, as long as it's in that, again, what's called the indenture, the document that actually controls the bond itself. The indenture is, is almost, it's equivalent to a contract between the company and the bondholders. Colorable bonds are bonds subject to redemption. So in other words, if you have, most bonds are 30 years. I mean, there's, some are 10, some are 15, some are 20, but um, the most common would be 30 years. So let's say you have a 30-year bond that's callable in 10 years. So what that means is that you're going to get your interest payments for 10 years. At the end of 10 years, the company may call that bond back, meaning that at that point you would get paid the face value of the bond. Um, most corporate bonds have a face value of $1,000. That, again, can be uh, changed or modified, but 
the most common is is a thousand. That's kind of the industry standard. So if you have a thirty year thousand dollar callable bond, then uh, with a ten year call, then at the end of the ten years, the company would simply pay you the thousand dollar face value for that bond, and then they would, in essence, they they would be redeeming the bond. So that's uh, a way for the company, in essence, to take back its debt. So that uh, is a rather common feature. Um, the difference with a lot of these bonds are, for example, the callable bond would actually sell at a discount compared to other bonds because if the company has the option to call it back, then it's worth less to the investor, right? Because instead of a guaranteed 30-year investment, now they don't know how long that investment is, right? If you have a 10-year call period, um, it may be called at the end of 10 years, it may be called at the end of 15 years, you just don't know. So as an investor, uh, because of that risk, you would require a higher rate of return, so the company would have to pay more interest or higher interest on those callable bonds. So let's move on to equity securities, probably the area that most... Uh, most common and the one that most people are most familiar with. So how do we issue shares? Well, again, let's start off just like we did with bonds with some of the definitions. What is an equity security? Well, it's a source of capital creating an ownership interest in the corporation. That's the main difference between equity and debt or equity and bonds. Again, bonds does not create an ownership interest and equity security does. And when we're talking about uh, equity securities, we're talking about shares, which is a proportionate ownership interest in a corporation. So you could buy one share, you could buy a thousand shares, you could buy a hundred thousand shares of, of a particular company. So it's just a proportion, proportionate ownership interest. And the percentage of the company that you own would be the number of shares that you own divided by the number of total shares that are outstanding. So that would give you your ownership interest in that particular company or a corporation. There's also something called treasury stock, which are shares that are reacquired by a corporation. It happens quite a bit as well, where companies will actually issue stock and then they will actually go, especially publicly traded companies, they will go out into the markets and buy back or reacquire some of those shares. And when they're held by the corporation, we call those stocks or shares treasury stock. So what about the authority to issue? Well, only those shares authorized in the Articles of Incorporation may be issued. The Articles of Incorporation actually say, uh, you know, will provide the specific amount of shares that the company is allowed to issue. So it may be 1,000 shares, could be 10,000, could be 100,000, could be a million. It's just whatever the Articles of Incorporation say. Um, there's also something called preemptive rights, and that's actually very, very important to shareholders, especially those that have a controlling interest in a corporation, and, and in particular, if it's a closed corporation. So preemptive rights are the rights to purchase a pro rata share of new st stock offerings. So let's say I'm a 50% share, uh, shareholder in a corporation and the corporation issues, you know, let's say, a million dollars worth of stock or a or million shares worth of stock. Well, as a 50% owner of the company, if those shares fall into you know, hands that are not mine, right? If, if other people buy those shares and I don't have an opportunity, then it will dilute my percentage ownership of the company. So in order to prevent that and so that I could maintain the same uh, share of the company that I presently have, then normally I would have preemptive rights. And so what that means, again, in my example where a million shares are issued and I control 50% of the company, I would have a preemptive right to purchase an amount of shares that would allow me to maintain my 50% interest in the company. 
So again, if, if it's just a million shares that would be outstanding, then I would have an option to purchase 500,000. Remember, it's an option. I, I can buy it or not, right? It's my choice, but I do have that preemptive right or that opportunity, or it's almost like a right of first refusal. So if I elect to purchase those 500,000 shares, then I will maintain my 50% interest in the company and the remaining 500,000 shares can be sold to uh, whoever at that point. Um, very, very common in closed corporations so that the, especially if it's family members, we want to keep the business in the family or maybe not the entire business, but we certainly want to keep control. Um, and that's not necessarily limited to a family business. It may be that I created the company and I, you know, I own 70% of the company and I want to keep control of the corporation as I grow. So as I uh, need more money to invest in capital or more capital to invest in, in net fixed assets, then I will actually issue new, the company will issue new shares, but, but I will, as the majority shareholder, have preemptive rights. What about the amount of consideration for the shares? Shares are deemed fully paid and non-assessable when a corporation receives the consideration for which the board of directors authorize the issuance of the shares, which in the case of par value stock must be at least par. So in other words, the Articles of Incorporation will actually also spell out how much each share should be sold for or, or what, at least initially, right, what the par value is. So if the par value is $100, for example, then when somebody pays $100, then that's it. You are the shareholder and, uh, you know, the, the company can't assess your or try and collect more than the $100 that that, uh, that you paid for the shares. So really, that's, that's what the amount of consideration for the shares really means. The book actually has here a, uh, a slide that talks about the different types of stock, it talks about uh, treasury stock, it talks about uh, outstanding stock, it talks about authorized, authorized but not yet issued, and it also talks about issued as well. So this kind of gives you an overview of, of all of that. And anything outside of what's authorized would be void, right? The Articles of Incorporation tell you exactly how many shares are authorized. So if the Articles of Incorporation say that a million shares are authorized, but you've only issued 500,000, then that means that you have 500,000 shares that are authorized, but not issued. And so the company can decide, the board of directors can decide uh, when they are gonna issue those additional 500,000 shares that they are authorized to do or to issue. What about the payment for newly issued shares? Well, it could be in cash, could be paid in property, and services actually rendered. So we can exchange stock for services as a form of payment. Again, all of this as determined by the Board of Directors under the revised act. Uh, promises to contribute cash, property, or services are also permitted. So it's not just the the actual uh, transfer of these items, but the promise is also sufficient consideration for newly issued shares. And again, this is more common in small and, and closed corporations in, in big publicly traded companies. Obviously, we would expect cash. We're, we're not going to see property or services that are actually rendered. Um, unless it's one of the executives. Many of the executives are actually compensated for their services using uh, stock, right? We Mainly stock options. In fact, a lot of the uh, bulk of the executives on Wall Street, the, the most of the money that they make is not really from their salaries. Um, and again, I know it sounds like, like a lot when, when you haven't started working yet, but you know, a lot of these guys on Wall Street and women uh, make, you know, maybe three, four hundred thousand a year as a salary, which sounds like a lot, but it really is not uh, from a Wall Street perspective. But that's not really where they make their money. So they make it, they may have four hundred thousand dollars in salary, uh, 
And then they may have, you know, $5 million in stock options. And so that's really where the bulk of the compensation for their services comes. Now, within equity, we have different classes of shares or different classes of stock. The most common, and, and it's, it's actually called common stock, and that's stock not having any special contract rights. And so that's what we call it common. That is the most common. So when we think of shares, uh, the ones that are traded on Wall Street, for the most part, are really common stock. Preferred stock is stock having contractual rights superior to those of common stock. So for example, uh, common stock has dividend preferences. In other words, they must receive the full dividends before any dividend may be paid on the common stock. So if you own preferred stock, you always get paid first from the dividends. If there aren't enough or if there isn't enough money to pay the common stockholders, too bad. The, the preferred stockholders get paid first. They also have a liquidation preference, so they have priority over common stock uh, on the corporate assets upon li liquidation. So if a company goes out of business or shuts down, then preferred stockholders get paid first. Whatever's left over then goes over to the common stockholders. I already talked about stock options when I was talking about compensation to the executives. It's a contractual right to purchase stock from a corporation. And um, we can talk more about stock options in, in class if you're interested. I don't want to spend too much time on it since it's more of a finance issue, more than a legal issue. But again, very, very common in executive compensation. Again, most executives, the bulk of their um, salary uh, really comes from stock options and not from uh, an actual check that they get you know, every week or every couple of weeks. So here's a chart, and your book has, has this as well, which is a pretty good comparison of debt and equity securities. Talks about you know the ownership interest, the obligation to repay principal, fixed maturity, and all these other terms and conditions. And so it really, it's a great chart for you to um, study from, actually, where it compares the differences between debt and equity. It actually breaks down equity into the two main types, whether it's preferred or common, and it tells you how those behave. So let's move on to dividends. Uh, dividends and other distributions, there are different types of dividends and, and distributions. Distributions are transfers of property by a corporation to any of its shareholders with respect to its shares. And cash dividends are just, like the word says, you know, the most common type of distribution, which is, in essence, you, you get uh, a check for a specific amount for that particular dividend. Most dividends are paid quarterly. but They don't have to be. Um, in fact, a corporation does not have to declare a dividend if it doesn't want to. Uh, so that's another important fact. So property dividends are distribution in the form of property. Not, not very common at all, but, but it can be. Um, and also there's stock dividends, which is a proportional distribution of additional shares of stock. So in other words, instead of getting you know, money, you get you know, five additional shares, right? As a dividend or 10 additional shares or whatever the board of director decides that, that it wants to pay or, or is adequate to, to distribute. There's also something called a stock split. Each of the outstanding shares is broken into a greater number of shares. So most, most stock splits, or, or the most common is a two-for-one split. And so what that really means is that if you have 100 shares of stock, you split that into two. So now you have 200, or you, rather than split, I guess you multiply is, is the right word. So if you have 100 shares, uh, then and it's a two for one split then now you have 200 shares of stock the reason why companies do that is to lower the price of the stock so in essence if you got uh, you know stock that's a fifty dollars a share and you do a two for one split now you have twice the amount of outstanding shares and the you know the price of the dividend then 
drops by 50% to $25. So the reason why you would do a stock split is to make it more affordable. Uh, liquidating dividends, it's a distribution of capital assets to shareholders. So again, that's usually during the wind down phase or liquidation phase of a corporation. And so you, you're taking your capital assets and you're distributing it to your shareholders uh, because you're no longer going to be doing business. Redemption of shares. I talked a little bit about this, but it's a corporation's exercise of the right to purchase its own shares. Corporations will do that. Um, one of the reasons to do that, again, is to control the stock price, right? So if you buy back shares, again, you're taking, you're limiting the supply of, just to look at it from an economics perspective, you're limiting the supply. And so when you limit the supply, the price goes up. So that is one way or one reason why companies buy back shares. Number one is, is control, right? By buying back shares, now the company owns more shares, which means it's going to have more, more control. So that's one reason. The other reason, uh, obviously, is to control the price. As, as you buy back more shares, uh, the share price uh, will rise, especially if, there, if there's a demand. If you keep the demand constant, but you reduce the supply of the stock, then you're, you're increasing the price. Acquisition of shares. It's a corporation's repurchase of its own shares. Um, so again, redemption is the exercise of the right and the acquisition is the actual purchase. So that's legally we make a distinction there, right? So redemption is uh, the corporation's exercise of the right to purchase its own shares and acquisition is the actual repurchase of, of the shares themselves. Now, legal restrictions on cash dividends. Dividends may be paid only if the cash flow and applicable balance sheet tests are satisfied. So in other words, if you're gonna make a distribution or you're gonna declare a dividend, you have to have the liquidity to do it. And so there's something called a cash flow test. Corporation must not be or become insolvent. In other words, unable to pay its debts as they become due in the usual course of business. So if a company is insolvent or if declaring a dividend would make the company insolvent, then uh, there's, there's a legal res restriction on, on declaring that dividend. That dividend should not be declared. Remember, dividends really are, are a result of net income, right? Once you have net, from net income, there are only two things that you could do with net income. You could declare a dividend or you can plow it back into the company in the form of retained earnings. Uh, most companies that are growing will, will not pay a dividend and will plow all of net income back into the company. In other words, keep it as retained earnings and they will use those funds to purchase uh, capital assets to, you know, net fixed assets and invest in infrastructure and so forth. Most mature companies, the ones that are not growing, will take a portion of that net income uh, and actually pay out as dividends. But again, there has to be positive cash flow the company cannot be insolvent there must be enough reserves to satisfy the liabilities or that distribution would be declared uh, illegal there's also the balance sheet test so we talked about the cash flow test the other test is the balance sheet test it, it varies among states and includes uh, the earned surplus test which is available in all states the surplus test and the net assets test, which is used by the model and revised acts. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on the definitions of these things. It's in your book. It's pretty straightforward. Nothing difficult about it, but it, it is important to understand that there are two different types of tests to determine whether there is a legal restriction on cash dividends. In other words, to determine whether cash dividends should be paid or not. So what are the key concepts when we're talking about the restrictions on distributions? Well, again, there's a slide in your book that actually 
explains all of this, and we do use accounting terminology for all of this, which obviously, as, as accounting majors, you should be familiar with what, what we mean with all of this. So we look at the total assets, and we look at the net assets as well, right? So if we take uh, net assets, um, we can actually divide that into earned surplus, which would be retained earnings, capital surplus, which is contributed capital in excess of par or stated value. Um, we have stated capital, which is contributed capital, and then we have liquidation preferences. So those would be uh, how we define our net assets. So our surplus would be our earned surplus and our capital surplus. And then at the very bottom there, we have liabilities. So, legal restrictions on liquidating distributions. States usually permit distribution in partial liquidation from capital surplus unless the company's insolvent. So that really is the key. A lot of these different types of distributions, whether it's a liquidating distribution, whether it's a dividend, um, will depend on whether the company's insolvent. If the company's not insolvent, it will usually be allowed. What about the legal restriction on redemptions of shares? Remember, redemptions of shares was when the company uh, decides that or, or determines that it's going to buy back some of its own shares. In most states, a corporation may not redeem shares when insolvent or when such redemption would render it insolvent, um, which is pretty obvious if you think about it, right? I mean, if you're insolvent, then you shouldn't be using that cash uh, to buy back shares and in particular you shouldn't be redeeming anything if you're insolvent or if doing so would lead you to be insolvent and again to me that's just common sense if you think about it legal restrictions on the acquisition of shares restrictions similar to those on cash dividends usually apply as well so what about the declaration and payment of distributions? Um, do shareholders have a right to compel a distribution? The declaration of distributions is within the discretion of the board of directors. So they are the ones that determine whether there will be a distribution or, or a dividend and how much. Only rarely will a court substitute its business judgment for that of the board. So in other words, um, you know, shareholders really don't have a right to compel a distribution. That's the short answer. The board of directors are the ones that decide and courts will not substitute their judgment for the board. So, um, in other words, the courts will not step in and compel uh, a distribution unless there's there's some very, very compelling reason or, or fraud or, or something really unusual with the board. What's the effect of the declaration? This is key. Once properly declared, a distribution is considered a debt that the corporation owes to the shareholders. So in other words, a corporation does not have to declare dividends. There is no liability for not declaring dividends. However, once the dividends are declared, then it becomes a debt. It becomes an obligation. And at that point, a shareholder could sue to enforce that obligation or, or that debt. So what about if dividends and distributions are improperly declared? What's the liability of the board of directors? And what's the liability of shareholders, right? Well, let's talk about directors first. The directors who assent to an improper dividend are liable for the unlawful amount of the dividend. So in other words, they're liable for that. And what do we mean by an improper dividend? Well, if the corporation is insolvent or if the corporation would become insolvent as a result of the dividend, that would be a situation in which the directors would be liable for the amount of that dividend. What about the shareholders? A shareholder must return illegal dividends if he knows of the illegality or if the dividend resulted from his fraud or if the corporation is insolvent. So again, 
those are really pretty much uh, common sense type of, of things that courts will, will always enforce. So we're going to finish off tonight by putting all of this together as far as the liability for improper distributions. One of the key distinctions that the courts will look at is, is the corporation solvent or is the corporation insolvent? Because obviously it's going to be treating it, uh, the courts will treat that very differently. So if we have a non-breaching director and the corporation it doesn't really matter in that case whether the corporation is insolvent or not. That non-breaching director will not be liable for an improper distribution. Likewise, a breaching director will be liable whether the corporation is solvent or not. Um, same thing with a knowing shareholder. The only place here we see a little bit of a difference between whether a corporation is solvent or insolvent is when we have an innocent shareholder. In other words, a shareholder received a, an improper distribution without engaging in any fraud or without knowing that that dividend was improper. You know, think, imagine that you all own 100 shares of, of corporation X, Y, and Z, and suddenly you get a check in the mail for you know, $5,000 for as a distribution. Um, and you're like, wow, great, right? You, you had no idea. You, you're just a shareholder. You don't participate really in the management. You don't, you know, you just, you have the shares as, as an investment. So you really don't keep track of, of what's going on. You don't participate in the management per se. So you're, you're innocent. You have no way of knowing. Well, the corporation is solvent, then you get to keep that dividend. But is, if the corporation is insolvent, then you would be liable and you would have to give that dividend back even though you were innocent, even though you didn't know that this was an illegal distribution and even though you didn't participate in any way in that illegal distribution. So that is really the only area where the courts will make a, a distinction or a difference between uh, whether a corporation is solvent and, and insolvent. Uh, it'll provide a different result. So this is all for chapter 34. Um, I'm going to sign off for now, and then we will continue with chapter 35, which I will upload tomorrow.